Hi everyone, Dr. Bob here. And I want to talk to you about a concept that is unrecognized and extremely significant in terms of how cancers start and how we might best treat them. So, again, for those who are not familiar with what I do, um, I interpret life from the perspective of flowing energy in a field known as far from equilibrium thermodynamics that was pioneered by Ilya Prigogine, who received the Nobel Prize for basically uh, discovering the concept, uh, formalizing the concept of flow-dependent structures, also known as dissipative structures, also known as spatio-temporal structures, because they're structures in space and time, like us. Okay. So the details of how flowing energy organizes matter and does so typically with oscillations going on and um, one of the big oscillations that I constantly mention is the balance between free radical production caused by the electron transport system which makes energy efficiently and inefficient energy production via for example glycolysis or fat burning or burning of proteins. Uh, in particular, though, fat burning. So what we're looking at really is how cells are constantly basically vibrating in all of these different metabolic modes, always driven by the cell's need, so to speak, physical need, to continue surviving, meaning for that flow-dependent structure to be maintained. So... There are so many pathways. If you look at a metabolic map, you know, it's this incredibly complex picture of all of the metabolic reactions that are occurring in a, a typical cell. And what I'm saying is that you can't look at that static picture. You have to look at the flow and how different pathways swell and contract uh, constantly in time, always driven by their need to minimize excess free radical production, which would otherwise initiate either apoptosis or necrosis, where the cells just burst open. So what I'm, where I'm going with this is that these cells are constantly vibrating in all of these different metabolic flowing patterns. And when you go and you try to kill a cell, you're going to interfere with different patterns and different patterns are going to be able to survive the uh, insult of whatever you're trying to do to kill that cancer cell. So the key concept here is that if you have a cancer cell existing in a metabolic state that can survive the insult, that metabolic state gets fixed in place not genetically, but epigenetically, so that that cell now has the ability to survive and to continue surviving and replicating, potentially, or not. If it replicates, then you have an active cancer. If it sleeps, then you have senescence, which could wake up at any time in the future. So, again, what we do with therapies is we trap cells in different metabolic states. And when you're treating cancers, you want every state to not function to promote the survival of that cell. However, when you happen to have one that can survive, you are trapping that metabolic state. Now, what's going on is that typically the cell has found some way of surviving the excess free radicals that are being produced by minimizing their production or countering the consequences of their effects. Typically not done in a fashion that's for uh, the long-term benefit of the organism, but is for the benefit of that cell. So basically cancers are selfish cells that no longer know that they're part of you and have to work as part of you for your survival, but have now become more biochemically in tune with uh, their own survival. They've lost communication. So that's one of the big issues here. When you have these carbohydrates burning cells making energy efficiently, 
then you can have important differentiated functions. In other words, what evolution selects for is this continued increase in complexity that allows for a continued increase in adaptability to a environment. And we change the environment and actually make it more complex, which means we have to become more complex to continue to move forward in that environment. And uh, cancer cells basically are little uh, mistakes that have gone awry in that their efforts are now simply for their survival. So um, when you select for one of these altered states, typically there's going to be excess free radical production and a reduction of other protective mechanisms. So that what you see happening, in my opinion, is that you're going to focus change mutations uh, both at the gene itself, but more importantly, often in the controlling regions of, of genes, what historically had been called junk DNA, but we now know is very important. So the outcome here is that when you treat cancer cells with chemo or radiation, you select for the metabolic state that allows for the cell to survive. That gets fixed as a epigenetic phenomena so that the, those genes are reproducibly expressed over generations. And therefore, you have to be able to undo that if you want to kill the cancer. And that's exactly what cannabis does by turning on fat burning. It kills the cells that are uh, dependent on the carbohydrate and are not able to oscillate into a survival mode during that, that treatment. Um, however, therefore, we still can have those cells that have learned to go back and forth between fat burning and carbohydrate burning or protein burning, whatever allows them to survive, whatever oscillation they trap. So under those circumstances, you have to do additional things because when the cells are fat burning, they are eating themselves, autophagy, but they don't eat themselves randomly. They eat their damaged pieces, free radical identified damages. You know, they cause chemical changes in your RNA, your DNA, your proteins, your carbohydrates, your fats. And those changes are recognized by the complexity of your biochemistry and therefore are used to alter either the production directly or quench the free radicals so that the cells can survive. It's all very, very simple, really. So hence, with that in mind, you need adjunct therapy along with cannabis or anything else that turns on fat burning when that alone is not sufficient to kill cells. And what you'll find is that most of the herbs that we use promote fat burning. So most of these things that we know to be beneficial and to prevent cancers actually are man manipulating metabolism at this basic level between our fuel sources. So that's my story for today. You know, it's pretty significant to understand that uh, as a cell oscillates through its metabolic possibilities, it can be trapped in one and that becomes your cancer cell. And now if it can go on to learn how to survive in that altered state where it's going to be able to basically go back and forth between fat and sugar burning, those are the drug resistant, what's called often stem cells, drug resistant stem cells. But we have to look at that in more detail as well. As a stem, a true stem cell differentiates and becomes one of your cells, um, it does so by making energy efficiently, meaning sugar burning, once again. And um, so naturally, most cancers tend to start out that way. And it's when we treat them that you select for the ones that don't finish that way. <laughs> and often finish us. So this is a very important concept, and uh, I hope people will start to think about it more and understand it. I, I've largely given up with the uh, medical establishment and the scientists. They're so tunnel-visioned, they're so uh, indoctrinated by the status quo that it's very hard for them to break out, and occasionally you find some that can, and they understand what I'm talking about, but in general I prefer to talk to uh, youth and students and we the people because it's not hard to understand and because we have tools now 
that allow us to go forward and treat those initial cells via metabolic manipulation using cannabis and the CB2 receptor. And then when we need to go back and add an additional kick to the whole process, intravenous vitamin C on top of your cannabis treatment gives you an extremely effective cure from what we've anecdotally seen. Peace and love.